Hi, I'm Kelly. And I'm Carrie. And, and we're, we're Identical, Identical Twins. Twins. We are so excited to talk to you about all things related to church music here on Hymn Talk, Talk Twin, Twin Talk. Talk. <laughs> now each week we will break down a hymn. It could be an old favorite, or it could be one you've never heard of. But it is our prayer that you will worship with us no matter what song it is. So let's get started here on Hymn Talk, Talk Twin Talk. Talk. Well, good morning. Good morning. Do you know who's who? I'm Carrie. I'm Kelly. And, and we're, we're identical, identical twins. <laughs> and <laughs> so if you don't already know, we host a podcast called Hymn Talk, Talk Twin, Twin Talk. Talk. And there are so many beautiful Christmas carols and hymns that we could choose to make a podcast about. Yeah. We just released our 71st episode. And in 71. <laughs> And in those episodes, we've had seven that were devoted to Christmas, Christmas hymns. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Away in a Manger. Joy to the World. O Holy Night. What Child is This? Mary, Did You Know? And I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Now, last year at this time, we stood up here and we talked about that hymn, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. That was last Christmas. Do you remember? We said emphatically, we, we are, are the bells. bells. We are the ones who ring out the good news of Jesus Christ. And actually, just a couple of months ago, we were here again, and we talked about the hymn, Angels from the Realm of Glory. And that will be released as a podcast episode coming up. Mm -hmm. And that week, we talked about how every person, every creature at the birth of Christ, the angels, the shepherds, the wise men, they all responded with worship, even as a baby. Jesus Christ was the one all creation worshipped. So today's hymn will be our ninth Christmas hymn episode. And honestly, there's like no shortage of hymns to talk about. No. M people ask us all the time, what will you do on your podcast when you run out of hymns? Well, we have news for you. We're, We're never, never running, running out, out of hymns. hymns. I mean, there's just so many. There's so many. There's so many. At this point, it's just about picking the right one mm -hmm. at the right time. Mm -hmm. And, so, you know, if you have a suggestion, you should tell us. You should let us know. We'll put that one on the show. And we love doing listener-generated podcasts. So how did we pick today's hymn? How did we pick it? Well, I mean, we argued. Much debate. Yes. She was so stubborn. She wouldn't listen to any of my ideas. Kelly had her heart set on this one, but I wasn't really a big fan. So we were arguing. She wouldn't budge. No, nope. yeah. we were going back and forth. So we just started researching again all of the hymns we could come up with. Yeah. And then it became pretty clear which one we should choose. We found a very special hymn. Okay, so this hymn has a hymn writer from Massachusetts. And the hymn writer is a well-known pastor. He was actually called the Rick Warren of his day. That's what we call him. Now, he wrote the hymn along with his church organist. So the pastor and the organist work together. We love a good collaboration. Yes, yes. And get this. The organist wrote the music for the hymn the night before the Christmas service. Imagine writing the night before who the would, service. Who, who would, would ever do that? Do that? Who That's would crazy. leave it all to crazy. the night before? Crazy. I don't know anyone. No. Nuts. No. This hymn writer also gave a powerful eulogy for President Lincoln following his death in 1865 in Philadelphia. And finally, this very special hymn is published in over 800 hymnals. So we gave you some pretty awesome hints there. I'm sure by now you know that today's hymn is O Little, Little Town of Bethlehem. Ah, oh, we were wondering if you would clap. So maybe, so people must know, on our, on on our, our episode, podcast. on our podcast, there's always applause when we announce the hymn. So, so you, you did not disappoint. Yes. So as we said early, earlier, we've researched 71 hymns for our podcast, and we just love it when a hymn is written by a pastor, a theolo theologian. Right. When a pastor, you know, a man who is educated in the faith, when, when a pastor puts words together for a hymn, it is usually full of truth, full of theological wisdom, and full of scripture. And today's hymn is just like that. Yes, it's a Christmas hymn. And yes, it tells of the birth of Christ. But it tells us so much more. And we are so excited to tell you about it. So let's hear about this pastor slash, slash hymn, hymn writer, writer from Massachusetts, Phillips Brooks. 
Phillips Brooks was born on December 13, 1835 in Boston, Massachusetts. His mother's name was Mary Ann Phillips and his father was William Brooks. He attended the Boston Latin School and Harvard University. In fact, there is a building on the campus right now named in his honor, the Phillips Brooks House. It is home to five religious societies, a reading room, a chapel, a lecture hall, and the Social Services Committee. Now, Phillips was a bright student, a promising young student. He graduated from Harvard at, at the, the age, age of 19. 19. And he took a teaching job at his old high school, Boston Latin. Now, unfortunately, he wasn't that great of a teacher. Mm -mm. A particularly unruly group of students locked him in a classroom and spread explosive matches on the floor. Yeah. And unfortunately, there are more stories like that. Until he eventually resigned from teaching, not knowing at all what he should do next. He kind of slipped into a depression, and only after the urging from a friend at Harvard did he enroll in seminary. Now, you might think that this greatest preacher of the 19th century would just thrive at seminary. But he actually struggled there too. He did well academically, but as a preacher, he was lacking. None of his classmates thought he would ever amount to anything. But that only made Brooks more determined. Throughout his career, he took weekly voice lessons to help with his vocal production and locution. We're a big fan of voice lessons. Big fan. Yeah. yeah. So his hard work and practice definitely paid off as he eventually preached to hundreds and thousands of people. Now, you have to imagine this. Physically, he was about 6'4". He weighed over 300 pounds. And they say that he spoke from the pulpit at a mesmerizing 200 words a minute. 200 words a minute. I was trying to go fast. I don't even know. Do you think Pastor Joseph does 200? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> 200 words a minute. And we read, this is a quote, that his sermons, are you ready? We're like a freight train rolling downhill or a freighter plowing down river with an ebbing tide. He was, he was completely, completely captivating and utterly spellbinding. Now, Brooks was the pastor at Trinity Church right here in Boston, and today there stands a statue in his memory. Brooks is depicted holding out one hand as if addressing the congregation, while the other hand rests on the Bible. And behind him stands Jesus to show that Jesus was guiding every word that came out of his mouth. Another statue to honor the late pastor can be found on the North Andover Common, just a short distance from here, North Andover, right Massachusetts. Right here in North Andover. And the inscription on that statue reads, to commemorate the nobility of the man, the richness of his intellectual gifts, and the complete consecration of his life to the cause of Jesus Christ. This monument is erected by men and women of many creeds. Brooks would spend his summers in North Andover at a home that actually still stands there today on Osgood Street. In fact, there is a school in North Andover called Brooks School, and that's named after him. Mm -hmm. So we love when our research reveals all these local connections. And Phillips Brooks, we have to believe that he touched many, many lives here in Massachusetts. I think it's time for a Him Talk Twin Talks field trip. We're heading to North Andover. Who's coming? <laughs> now, but this hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, was actually written while he was serving at a church in Philadelphia. He was the pastor at the Church of the Holy Trinity. He was a pastor there for seven years, from 1862 to 1869. And if you know your American history, those years were really hard in America. He preached right through the Civil War. He gave that powerful eulogy for President Lincoln. And he saw the Episcopal Church become divided completely over the social issue of slavery. In 1865, he reached his breaking point and he took a sabbatical to rest and recharge. And during the sabbatical, he traveled to the Holy Land. That was December of 1865. He actually rode on horseback from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, and he arrived in Bethlehem just in time to attend the Christmas Eve service at the Church of the Nativity. Now, I know many of us have traveled to the Holy Land. Who has been to Bethlehem? And have you been to the Church of the Nativity? That's, that's supposedly where Jesus Christ was born. Now, that service that night, Christmas Eve, at the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, was five hours long. 
It was filled with scripture. It was filled with singing. Brooks just marveled that these believers could stand there and sing for hours on end in worship of the Christ child, the newborn king. Now that night, etched in his memory for years to come, would be the inspiration behind his now famous poem. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by yet in thy dark streets shine the everlasting light the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight this verse is all about bethlehem bethlehem is little it's still it's dark it's silent and all of the hopes and fears of all the years meet in this little, little town. town. So what do we know about Bethlehem? Well, it's the birthplace of Jesus. I would guess that the majority of people all over the world today know that Bethlehem is famous for having the birth of Christ take place there. That church of the nativity that we talked about and that Philip visited in 1865, that church was originally commissioned by Constantine the Great and built around 325 AD. And it is on the site that was traditionally considered to be the birthplace of Jesus. Both Matthew and Luke write about Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. We also see Bethlehem in the Old Testament. This was a thousand years before that night, before Jesus was born. We read about the young shepherd boy who would become king. Listen to 1 Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of, of Bethlehem. Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do, do you, you come, come in peace? peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This, this is, is the one. one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Right there, we see that God chooses a little boy to be king. King David from Bethlehem. In fact, Bethlehem ends up being called the, the city, city of, of David. David. And we all know David's story, right? The young shepherd who defeated a giant and who became king. He was the greatest king Israel had known to that point. But there's more. So 200 years later, from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, we read that the promised king, the promised Messiah, the one the world was waiting for, the one who would bring peace to all, 
would be from David's line. The great king of kings would be from the little shepherd boy from, from the, the little, little town, town of, of Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Listen to the prophet in Isaiah. For to us a child is born, to, to us, us a, a son, son is, is given. given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince, Prince of, of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there, there will, will be, be no end. end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from, from this, this time, time forth and, and forevermore. forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now God's people reading this passage in Isaiah probably didn't know what it meant. A kingdom that would have no end? A king who would rule with justice and righteousness? A prince of peace? Who could that possibly be? We read these passages and we think all of this was Brooks's hymnspiration. So that is what we call on the podcast when someone is inspired to write the hymn, the inspiration, we call it Inspiration. Yeah. No. Now, of Brooks course. is of course inspired by the birth of Jesus Christ. He's, he's inspired, inspired by, by the night in Bethlehem where they're singing. And he's inspired by these Old Testament prophecies about Christ. Just look at the words of his first verse. It's all about Bethlehem. He called it little, silent, still, and dark. Doesn't that sound like this passage in Isaiah? The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And now let's read today's passage from Micah, another prophecy of Christ. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and, and he, he shall, shall be their peace. peace. Micah chose to call Bethlehem little. little. And this was obviously something that caught Brooks's attention because he chose to call Bethlehem Little in his famous hymn. Now, because Brooks was an educated man of the faith, I'm sure he understood what that word little meant in the book of Micah. The Hebrew word is sawir, and it doesn't just mean small or little. It means young. It means insignificant. How could something so great come from little Bethlehem? What kind of king or Messiah would be able to establish peace forever? God's people must have had a million questions about who this Messiah would be, where he would come from, and, and when, when he, he would, would come. come. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to all on earth. Brooks waits until this second verse to name Jesus Christ. He writes that Jesus is born and Bethlehem isn't silent or dark anymore. The angels are there. The morning stars are proclaiming. And all are singing praises to God the King. We have to think he was remembering that Christmas Eve service he attended in Bethlehem. Five hours of singing. Many people were probably waiting for the entrance of a king. 
right? A mighty warrior who would be victorious. But Jesus' birth is so quiet. He was born in a humble stable in a little town. And what a surprise this was for his people. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his hand. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ answers in. And this is where Brooks tells us more of Jesus's story. It's not just his birth that we're singing about. It's a gift. It's the blessings of heaven. We are living in a world of sin and God, Christ, enters our world to be with us. He comes in quietly. No ear may hear his coming. I mean, he's God. If he wanted us to know about his birth, he would have made that happen. But he purposely chose this small, insignificant town of Bethlehem. He purposely chose the small stable with animals and shepherds. From the very birth of Christ, we see that God comes for everyone. God comes for the meek, the quiet, the humble. God, God comes for sinners. When Jesus was a grown man serving the people around him, many of the religious leaders criticized him for spending so much time with the insignificant people of the day. He sat and had dinner with the poor, the sick, tax collectors, what they would call sinners. sinners. In Luke 5, we read that the Pharisees and teachers of the law complained and asked, why? Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, righteous but sinners to repentance. Jesus calls us to repent. The Bible says that all who call on the name of the Lord, will be saved. So we call out to him, come to us, Jesus. Forgive our sins. Be born in us. Oh, holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Brooks chooses to end his hymn with a prayer, asking Jesus to forgive us and to be born in us. What a beautiful phrase, be, be born, born in, in us. us. Brooks just shows his mastery of the English language in this whole hymn. His poetry is lovely and sweet. He paints this perfect scene in Bethlehem. It's almost magical. The shining streets. The mortals Sleep. The angels are watching and wondering love. Be born in us. It all sounds so pretty. It almost sounds like a dream, like it could have happened by accident. But the circumstances around Jesus' birth were deliberate. He was born in that tiny, insignificant town of Bethlehem. His earthly father was an ordinary working man, a carpenter. His mother was a young girl, a teenager. There was no room for them anywhere in Bethlehem. He was born with cattle, laid in a manger, a humble birth. Every detail was planned by God. Hundreds of years before God chose 
Bethlehem, even the beginning of time, right? It was all planned and orchestrated by God. He chose Bethlehem, that tiny, insignificant town, to show us we are Bethlehem. We are small. And we might wonder, why, why would God want to pay any attention to us? And maybe in your life and your situation right now, you feel particularly small. Maybe you're in an inconsequential place right now. And maybe the problems in your life seem large and too difficult. Bethlehem should encourage you. God used tiny, insignificant Bethlehem to birth a king. God sees you. He sees you where you are. He knows you. He comes to you. He loves you. And he, he saved, saved you. He has a very significant way. He has a very significant purpose for you, for his kingdom. Just the way he used David the shepherd, Mary, and Joseph. You are never too small or too far away to be out of God's reach. You are never so far off the path that God stops loving you. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of heaven. So what else can we learn from this little town of Bethlehem? That in a dark world, Jesus is the light. Jesus Christ is the shepherd. He will shepherd his flock. That's us. We're the flock. Micah writes, he shall be great to the ends of the earth and he shall be our peace. He is the prince of peace. Now this peace may not be the peace that you think of, right? Peace isn't the absence of problems. In our dark and broken world, this side of heaven, there will always be problems. But the peace of Jesus comes when you turn to him in the midst of your problems. When we realize that he is the victor over death and evil, that is the peace of Jesus Christ. Both Micah and Isaiah wrote about it, and the peace is free for all, for just believing. And what is the last thing we learn from this little town of Bethlehem? That Jesus will come to us and he will be with us forever. That's the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave us his Holy Spirit to be with us. To guide us. To protect us. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. This is the God we worship. The, the King, King of Kings. Kings born in, in the little, little town of, of Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, Praise forever to the King of 